Well, that could be a very long story, but I'll try to make it brief. I think for me, as I look back, the crystallizing moment that then shaped much of what I did subsequently and involved my sustained commitment came in early May of 1945. I was then a graduating high school student in Canada, in Montreal, and the word came that the war, at least the European part of it, had ended. And there's, there was this tremendous surge of enthusiasm. And I remember I walked down the streets with many others cheering and so forth. And yet at the same time feeling that there was something wrong with that picture. Because everyone was cheering victory. And I was of course part of it in terms of victory over Nazism. But I was already aware of the fact, because of my antecedents and so forth, that half of Europe was in the hands of another menacing dictatorship, just as brutal as Hitlerism, namely Stalinism. And I had this sense of living at a time in which something was unfinished, and yet the public failed to understand it. And that, I think, influenced me very much in what I did subsequently, and when I went to Harvard as a graduate student, and committed myself to Soviet studies, I increasingly shifted from systematic, academic, detached, objective studies of the Soviet system, at which Harvard excelled, into a posture of trying to influence what our policy towards that reality ought to be. And by our policy, I meant the West, and increasingly I meant America because I became part of America. And I think that probably is the beginning of the answer to your rather big question, which then really shaped, which pertains to something that shaped the rest of my life. Well, I didn't have much choice about living in Poland because Poland, once it fell under Stalinism, was not exactly a place where you could go and develop your own identity and implement your aspirations personally as well as philosophically. Um, I only lived three years of my life in Poland, actually. But I ended up at Harvard largely accidentally. I got a fellowship when I graduated from McGill University to go to Oxford. But then it turned out that I wasn't yet a Canadian citizen, and I lost the fellowship. I had not much choice, but things lucked out for me in a way, and there's no point going into too much detail. I ended up at Harvard. And Harvard at that time was initiating and in effect was in fact one of the two leading centers of the studies of the Soviet Union, the other one being Colombia. And that was of course the perfect fit for me. So that's how I ended up at Harvard. And America being America, so congenial to non-Americans, it was only a question of time before I began to feel almost like a native-born American participating in the politics of the country watching McCarthyism, being appalled by it, identifying to some extent with the Republicans when they were preaching liberation, and then becoming disillusioned with the idea when in 1956 Hungary rose, became independent, the Soviet Union reacted by crushing it, and America did nothing. And then I said to myself, obviously this country will not pursue a policy of liberation by violence but one shouldn't be satisfied entirely simply with containing the Soviet Union politically, offsetting it militarily by our atomic weaponry, but we have to have a more affirmative policy which seeks to transform the Soviet Union and thus undo its imperial character and deprive it of the gains that it obtained by force of arms when it imposed the communist system on Central Europe. That became the sort of strategic impulse that motivated me. So I rejected the Republican concept of liberation, which Secretary of State Dulles advocated, to which President Eisenhower paid lip service, but being a very sensible man, didn't do much more than that. But I also felt that containment wasn't sufficient. It had to be containment plus something more.
And that led me increasingly to reassess what were the vulnerabilities of the Soviet system, in particular the Soviet bloc. And that was still an academic interest of mine. What was the Soviet bloc? It wasn't quite as uniform as we in the West thought it was. So if it isn't quite as uniform as we thought it was, what were the fissures in it? What were the points of difference? How could they be exploited? And that led me then in the 60s, when I moved to Columbia University to become also associated with the Council on Foreign Relations, within which I understood, undertook a more comprehensive study to which you referred, and that had an enormous impact subsequently. Perhaps we can talk about that. Well, clearly the key professors at Harvard were Professor Friedrich, who was a student of totalitarianism, and with whom I ended up writing a joint work on totalitarianism, namely what's new about it, what's unique about it. Yes, of course, autocracy has as long a history as mankind, but what is unique about totalitarianism, namely its utopian, uh, fanatical, ideological urge to recreate society and to remake the human being, and how that then affects the human condition so adversely and what can be done about it. Professor Feinsod, who became my sponsor, my closest sort of teacher, was then particularly engaged in the study of the Soviet Union and the Stalinist system. How did it work? How did it differ from Hitlerism? And how was it similar to Hitlerism? What were its unique features? And that engaged me in a much more systematic study of the Soviet system itself. That, in a sense, combined with another facet of the issues. If there are peculiarities to the Soviet system, to the Stalinist system, what do they tell us about its potential weaknesses? And the same thing applied to the Soviet empire, the Soviet bloc, communists in different Central European countries, initially fanatical, but after a few years preoccupied with power, with, with its privileges, with its opportunities, still dependent on the Soviet Union, with the dramatic exception of Tito and Yugoslavia, but still dependent, and at the same time increasingly domesticated. How can one take advantage of that condition? And that led me in the course of the 60s to start advocating a variant of the policy of containment. That is to say, not liberation by force or whatever other means, which were never specified, how do we keep alive the spirit of uh, distinctive identity in Central Europe, Radio Free Europe, broadcasts? What other actions can we undertake to stimulate a sense of national awareness? How do we play on the vanity and interests of the new communist elites? By embracing them, but also by changing them, by seducing them, and so forth. And that led to the book that you mentioned. The Council on Foreign Relations in New York at the time commissioned two books, one by Henry Kissinger, which he published under the title, if I'm correct, The Troubled Partnership. And in it, he developed his concept very much connected with the Congress of Vienna, his own studies of it, namely, how you divide the world so that it is, it is stable. How do you accommodate? And in some respects, its underlying assumption was we keep what we have, they keep what they have, neither side threatens. And that was particularly important in an age in which atomic weapons became so dangerous. And therefore, avoiding war was absolutely critical. I did not dispute that latter part, but I did feel that we should be able, under the umbrella of a nuclear standoff, be able to pursue policies which advanced our interests which produced a different geostrategic situation in Europe eventually by exploiting the weaknesses of that artificial creation, which was the Soviet bloc. And I wrote the other book, the C Council commissioned two books. And my book was entitled, as you indicated yourself, Alternative to Partition. And I think the subtitle was something like uh, the policy of peaceful engagement or something along these lines. And that was, in a sense, a strategic design, which built 
on the need for avoidance of war in the nuclear age, Kissinger, Republicans, but which at the same time went beyond cannon. Let's just contain them and see what happens. Eventually, they'll presumably get tired and die off, but that was a long-range prospect. Or you exploit the opportunities inherent. Once one understood what were the real vulnerabilities of the Soviet system, and I'll just mention a couple. Multinationalism based on imperialism. So nationalism became a potential source of collision with the imperialism. A degradation of the human being, massive terror, which creates literally millions of people who feel deprived, hurt, mistreated, uh, resentments against recent history, the attraction of the West and the cultural magnetism of the West, particularly for Central Europeans who felt themselves to be more European than part of a Eurasian empire ruled from Moscow. All of that created enormous opportunities, in my view, for a policy of what I called peaceful engagement. And that became the official policy of the United States in October of 1966, when I succeeded in a variety of ways we haven't talked about, in playing a role already within the Democratic administration, and in selling this idea to President Johnson, so much so that the New York Times, in reporting on that speech on its front pages, actually referred to me specifically, connecting me with the words peaceful engagement and the ideas behind it, which the president embraced. My father was a diplomat. He was very rational, very idealistic. Uh, when he served in Germany, he was involved in violating the rules of his own government in issuing quite a few Polish passports to German Jews mm. to help them get out of Nazi Germany, which could have been troublesome for him if the Nazis had gotten hold of him after the beginning of the war. But we were in Canada during the war. We were already out. So I didn't go through the horrors of World War II, but I was aware of their scale. I was in a very academic environment, Harvard, detached, analytical. That influenced me also. And last but not least, I was pragmatic. I said earlier in our discussion, I did favor the policy of liberation. Because initially I thought it was serious. It was seriously meant by the United States. We had an atomic monopoly in effect, if not in fact by then. But in effect, we did have in terms of delivery systems and so forth. So I thought if the opportunity arose, we could intimidate the Soviets by the threat of force. And then I realized rather painfully in 1956 uh, that that was just words, uh, that there wasn't really a commitment behind it, and that America, right or wrong, a country that loves peace, uh, is kind of prudently pragmatic and and cautious, is not going to plunge into war to liberate someone. And that led me to think very seriously about alternatives. And that had a series of accidental consequences. Uh, Senator Kennedy, who by the latter part of the 50s was contemplating running for president, somehow or other became interested in my ideas. 